the two to forty-three. When they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed Jesus, they nailed Jesus to a cross, and criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gave hold for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed at him. He saved the others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of salt wine and calling out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you are the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too. Why you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Now Pastor Lackis will deliver the sermon today entitled A God Who Is Not Afraid. Please. The grace and peace of Christ be with all of us today. Well, today, as we mentioned, today we celebrate Christ the King. Today we celebrate that Jesus Christ is the Lord and King over all things. King of all creation, King through all eternity, and King over life and death. But what does it mean to be a king? What does it mean to be a king? Even though in Taiwan we don't have a king, we don't have a royal family, I think we've seen enough examples from other countries to know what it's like to be royalty. If you're like me and grew up in a country like Australia where we actually do look to a royal family, the royal family in, in, uh, in England, you can't help get past a week without seeing pictures of royal families and royalty on the front of all the magazines. But if we had to describe what a king's life is like, maybe three things. Maybe three things would come to mind. First, we know that kings live in great luxury. Kings live in enormous palaces filled with beautiful furnishings and decorations. They live in these opulent, beautiful places. When my family and I were living in Germany, even though the kings and princes were all long gone, those palaces still remain. They're still there today. And they're popular places to go on weekends. People would go and spend time in the beautiful gardens or they'd go on tours through the, the palace buildings. They would marvel at those historical things that they see there, marvel at all the amazing treasures and furniture inside and imagine what it would be like to live that type of life. What it would be like to live a life full of wealth and luxury and beauty. Maybe the second thing we think of when we think about kings is their great power their power and authority to command other people and to get what they want. After all, kings don't live in those palaces all by themselves. They're surrounded by servants. They're surrounded by hundreds of people who work hard every day to give the king and his family everything that they want. Normal people like us, well, we don't get that chance. Normal people like us, we get used to the hundreds of little disappointments every day. We know that we can't always have what we want. There are so many limitations on our lives. But to be a king feels like there's no limitations there. To be a king is to have power and authority to command others and to demand something. 
demand something and then immediately get it. To have people listen to you and do whatever you say. And that sounds so great. Sounds like a great part of being a king. Maybe the third thing that we think about is the way that kings are protected. Every day in London, thousands of people go to the palace there to look at the guards protecting the queen and the royal family. The palace itself is a famous place and it's great for tourists. Tourists love to go there and have a look at it. And the palace is a place of protection. There's high walls there, there's security systems, the soldiers are there out the front guarding. There's security personnel, they carry guns and weapons. And yes, the tourists go and take photos of them and I think they're really fascinating. But their job isn't to be a tourist attraction. Their job is to protect the royal family, to keep them safe, to keep other people, normal people like me, away. Here at church, here at the church office, if anyone wants to come and see me, they just come to my office and come and say hello. At the palace, well, I can't just walk in off the street and go and say hello to the royalty. The royal guards are there to make sure that normal people never get a chance to get close to the ruler. They're there to keep a good distance between king and queen and the ordinary common people. But if all of these things are what it means to be a king, if being a king means living in wealth and luxury, having the power to boss other people around, and living a safe and protected life far away from ordinary people, then how do we talk about Christ as being a king? Christ doesn't seem much like that at all. That's why at the scene of the crucifixion, the scene that we just read about in today's scripture reading, the idea that Jesus is a king, that's a laughable one. The people use that to make fun of Jesus. They use that idea that he's a king to tease him and mock him over and over again. Because he really doesn't look much like a king. First, today's text opens in the last place that we would ever expect to find a king. There's no palace here. There's no luxurious garden, there's no golden furniture. There's only a terrible place of pain and suffering. A place that Luke tells us is called the skull. It's a place of dirt, a place of blood. It's a place of sharp wood, of torture and death. And it's a place where three very ordinary people have come to die. In the very simplest of words, Luke tells us that in this horrible place of death, the soldiers simply grab hold of Jesus and nail him to a cross. At first sight, that doesn't look very kingly. We're used to kings being special. We're used to kings being treated well. We're used to kings being different from everyone else. But here Jesus is just one more criminal in a group with others. He's stripped naked, nailed to a cross, and left there with a criminal on either side. But none of that means that Jesus isn't a true king. Despite the horror of that scene, do you know what I think is really incredible about this? It's that Jesus is there at all. That Jesus is there at all. None of us like being in places of death. None of us like that. We certainly don't like to be in places like Calvary. But Jesus, he is there. He's willing to be in a place like that. He's willing to be in a place of torture and death. If we think about modern kings and queens, I can't think of any who would really like to be in a place like that. A place of death and execution. Even if it was just to go and visit and look. But Christ, Christ the true king of all things, he is willing. Christ, the true king, is willing to walk into that place of death and suffering and to be there. He's willing to be there together with his people. He doesn't run away. He doesn't avoid it. He doesn't close his eyes and pretend that it doesn't exist. Christ, the king, is there in that terrible 
place of death. Today, of course, the places of death that we know the best aren't much like that. They're not much like Calvary at all. Today, we mostly see death come in hospital rooms, in the beds of our elderly homes and nursing homes. But wherever death does happen, we know that Christ is there <coughs> with us. We human beings are sensible. We human beings, we run away from death. We human beings, we stay far away from it. But Christ, the true King, is not afraid. Even in the darkest and most frightening of places, He is there with us. In all of these worlds, places of pain and death, Christ is there. But what's even more amazing than Christ just being there is that He's not there just to be a visitor. And he's not there just to be a tourist. Sometimes the kings and the rulers of this world, we can admit it, sometimes the kings and rulers, they do go to bad places. They go to places of death and suffering. And we see the way they do it. They turn up in their comfortable cars. They turn up with their assistants and their security people. They spend 10 or 20 minutes there, have their photos taken for the newspapers, and then they go back home. But that's not the way it is with Christ here. At Calvary, Christ isn't a tourist. He's not just there to visit. He's not just there to have a look. He's there to be together with those who are about to die. And he's there to die himself. And that's not faith. That's not faith. It's easy for us to fall into this trap of thinking, oh, Jesus, well, yeah, he's kind of special. His death isn't like everyone else's. It's a bit unusual. It's not ordinary like ours. But that's not true. It's not pretend. It's not just a bit of a show. There is nothing fake about the death that Jesus is going to experience here. There's no cheating involved. The nails are real. The cross is real. And his death is very, very real. But I think that's what makes Christ the very real King that He is. That He is really willing to do that. He's really willing to come and be here with us, to even go through death together with us, and never to run away, never to leave us. That's so hard for us to understand. It's so hard for us to grasp, because the kings and the rulers that we know in this world, they're not like that. The kings and rulers that we know in this world, they use whatever power and authority they have to avoid pain, to avoid suffering. The kings we know, they use whatever authority they have to get out of trouble, to avoid punishment, to save themselves and to run away. That's why none of the people watching this, that's why none of the people there at Calvary watching the crucifixion recognize Jesus as a true king as the true king. Because unlike other kings, Jesus doesn't try to escape. The soldiers laugh at Jesus. They tell him to save himself if he can. After all, that's what a king would do. The religious leaders, they laugh at Jesus and say, yeah, well, if he really is the Messiah, if he really is the chosen one, let him save himself. That's what important people do. They save themselves. Even one of the other crucified criminals mocks Jesus. If he really is the Messiah, if he really is the King, then he should save himself. Use his power to run away from death. Use his power to get out of there and take them with him. After all, running away from trouble is kind of normal. It's only natural. I think most of us would really do the same. Faced with a terrible death, faced with torture and pain, I think most of us would do everything in our power to get away. But the amazing thing is that Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't run away. Jesus doesn't watch the cross and the nails getting closer and closer to him and then bail out. 
He doesn't say, well, you know, this was all kind of fun the last couple of years, but I don't want to play this game anymore. I'm going home. In weakness, in weakness, people grab at any chance to escape suffering. Grab at any chance to get out of a dangerous situation. I think comfortable earthly rulers, they're often the first people to use their authority to do that. To get away. They're the first to get on their aeroplanes and leave. But Jesus isn't like that. Christ, the true King, is not afraid. He doesn't call on His power and His authority to escape. He doesn't call on His power and authority to run away from death and to leave us there behind. To leave us to face it all on our own. That's why it's not about escaping. It's not about escaping for Jesus. It's not about leaving. It's not about running away. By not leaving, by not running away, that's how Jesus shows his real power and his real authority, his real determination to stand firm right there, to be our best friend, to stand beside us and go through everything together with us. Whatever problems we're going through in life, I want you to really remember that none of that really compares to what Christ went through already on Calvary. And if he didn't run away from that, he's not going to run away from the problems we face every day. He's not going to leave us now. We see this really all through Jesus' life. Do you remember back at the beginning of the story, back in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is out in the desert and he's tempted by Satan. In the story, in one scene, Satan takes him to stand on the highest point of the temple and he challenges Jesus. He says to him, If, if you really are of God, Jump off. If you really are the Son of God, use your divine powers. The angels of heaven, they'll come and save you. Take advantage of it. Use your divine powers to get out of all of this mess. But Jesus refuses. Here now at the end, on the cross, that same mocking temptation comes back to Jesus again. Comes back three times. If you really are who you say you are, if you really are someone important, if you really are the King and the Christ, then why don't you use your power to save yourself? Use your power to run away. None of those people laughing at Jesus there on the cross I don't think any of them really realized that he wasn't running away because of his power. Because he is the true king. Because he refuses to just think about himself. He refuses to cut loose and run away. It's because of his power that Jesus refuses to hide from death. He refuses to leave us alone in our troubles and in our suffering. He doesn't give in to that final temptation. He will live like us. He will suffer like us. He will go through pain like us. And he will even die like us. Even though he has the power to escape, he refuses to budge. He refuses to move from our side. He is going to stay right here with us. And that's a really incredible thing. That's a really incredible thing. Today we're so used to love being limited. We're so used to love coming with so many conditions. We're so used to people to people agreeing to let their love take them one step, two steps, take them a fair distance, but maybe not any further. Some of you who are as old as I am may remember many years ago there was an American singer, Meatloaf, who had a pop song out called, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. It's a good description 
of a lot of human love. It's a good description of a human love that pulls back at the end. A human love that pulls back from the worst things in life, that runs away from the hardest challenges, that isn't really willing to go through the absolute worst of the worst. But it's not a good description of Christ's love. Not a good description of His love at all. Because on the cross we see that the love of Christ, the King, really is an unlimited one. He doesn't hold Himself back from anything for our sake. And he doesn't run away from the hardest, from the scariest and the most frightening things that we will go through. Instead, Christ was willing to go through it all. Christ was willing to get dirty and go through the real struggles of life here together with us. He was willing to be grouped together with criminals even though he'd done nothing wrong. He was willing to suffer injustices and pain just like we have to every single day. He was willing to be laughed at and ridiculed. He was willing to be shamed and rejected. And he was even willing to suffer a terrible death here together with us. We're so used to seeing the powerful use their power to get away, to avoid trouble, to avoid having to put up with the sufferings that we have to put up with. Because they're afraid to live like normal people. They're afraid to go through all of that, all of those troubles. But in Christ we see a real king who's not afraid. In Christ we see a king who doesn't hold himself back or protect himself. In Christ we see a God who is not afraid. Not afraid to leave the glory of heaven and to be with us ordinary people. We see a God who's not afraid to set his power aside. Not afraid to become vulnerable and weak in order to go through what we go through, to go through suffering and death right here together with us, and to do that for us and for our salvation. There's no other God or King in history who compares with that. When we first read the story of the crucifixion, on the surface, on the surface level, there really doesn't seem to be a lot that's very positive there. We watch Jesus get nailed to a cross. We watch him get humiliated and mocked. We watch people laughing at him as he hangs there, dying. And on the surface, it does all seem so depressing, so horrible and terrifying. But we should let that trick us. We shouldn't let that horrible scene at Calvary block us from seeing the wonderful, incredible light of love and forgiveness and grace that is there. That immense, incredible light of love and forgiveness that shines through in this story. Because here, despite the pain and the horror, we see amazingly good news. Good news of Christ's salvation for all the world. So many times we've heard Jesus say how he had come to search out and save the lost. And that's exactly what he does here at Calvary. Right up to his dying breath. Maybe the people around Jesus, maybe those who are watching his death, maybe they don't see anything too positive here. But in the middle of death, Christ brings incredible salvation. And we see that in two wonderful places. The first, the first amazing thing we see is that Jesus brings forgiveness and salvation to those who aren't even looking for it. He brings salvation and forgiveness to those who are actively killing him. As he's there, as he's there suffering and dying up on the cross, he looks down on the soldiers who have pounded those nails through his hands and feet, and he gives them his forgiveness. He looks down on the Jewish religious leaders, the ones who plotted this terrible death for him. And he gives them his forgiveness. He looks down on the crowds watching him. The crowds that shouted for his crucifixion. The crowds that demanded his death. And he gives them the blessing of his forgiveness. As they stand there and point at him. As they hate him. As they laugh at him. As they make fun of him. And enjoy, him watch, enjoy watching him suffer and die. 
He pours out His salvation and forgiveness on them. Even though they didn't even want it. These people never asked for forgiveness. They didn't want forgiveness. They even laughed at the idea that Jesus could be in any position to offer salvation to anyone. But in His unlimited grace, Jesus doesn't let their meanness or their stupidity get in the way of His love and His salvation for the lost. Father, forgive them, for they just don't know what they're doing. Today we're surrounded by millions of people who are trapped in the same situation. Some people even in our own families. Blinded by sin, they reject Jesus. They push Him away. They turn away from Him. They make fun of Him. They mock Him. They laugh at Him. They even hate Him. They don't realize that the one they are rejecting, the one they are laughing at, the one they are hating, is the God who loves them so much. Is there any hope for them? Is there any hope for people like that? Well, in Christ's love and mercy, Christ doesn't shout at them in anger from the cross. He doesn't plan out His revenge in detail on these people. Instead, in love, He holds His arms out wide and prays for them. Forgive them, Father, for they just don't know what they're doing. But the second example is even more beautiful than that one. Sure, to the people standing around Jesus, to those who have come to laugh at his death and to enjoy watching it, Jesus is nothing like a king. He's just a nobody, a troublemaker, and they're happy to be rid of him. But next to Jesus, nailed on his own cross, one of the other criminals looks over at Jesus. And he sees Jesus for who he is. Recognizing Jesus as a true king, the criminal says the simplest of things to him. The simplest of things. Jesus, remember me. Jesus, on that future day when you actually come back to rule as a glorious king, remember me then. It's a simple and touching wish. These two men, both side to side, both crucified and bleeding, both close to death. And one turns to the other and says, in future, remember me. There on the cross, there on the cross, that dying man sees something that the others didn't see. But when Jesus hears that dying man's wish, Jesus turns to him and reveals a secret. He reveals to the man a secret that the others around them also haven't understood. There on the cross, Jesus turns to the criminal and tells him, you don't need to wait. You don't need to wait for some future day because I am already the king. I am already the King today. I am the Lord of all today. And I am here even in death beside you. The others don't see it. But this is my glory. This is my kingdom here and now. So you don't need to wait. Because today, here on this cross, I am already your true King. And today, you will be with me in paradise. So what does it mean to really be a king? What does it mean? In these last few verses, Jesus shows us the truth. It doesn't mean living in great palaces, filled with treasures and lovely furniture, because the true king of the world emptied himself of all glory and honour. He left all of that behind. And he came to live an ordinary life here, together with us. And to do that, to be with us, the true king of all creation wasn't afraid to become so ordinary. So ordinary that people looked at him on the street and didn't see anything special about him at all. 
just saw him as a worthless nobody. To be a king also doesn't mean using power and authority to run away from the world. It means laying aside that power, giving up the power to run away and hide from problems. It means not being afraid to suffer through pain and death right there together with us, with the king's people. And to be a king doesn't mean taking revenge on your enemies either. Instead, it means loving your enemies. Instead, it means holding out nail-pierced hands in love and forgiveness to those who hardly deserve it at all, to those who don't even want it. It means reaching out and saving those who are lost. It means opening up wide arms of grace to self-confessed criminals and sinners just like us. It means pouring out forgiveness and mercy on those who reject the King, on those who laugh at Him, on those who even want nothing to do with Him. And it means using those same arms of love to hold on to us tightly, not just in this world, but especially in the next, so that none of us, none of us who in our foolishness have wandered away from the King, None of us will ever be lost. In this life and in the next, the true King of love promises to hold on to us tight, to carry us home, so that we can be in paradise together with Him. Let's pray together. Christ our King, there's so much that we worry about. There's so much that we are scared of in this world. Every day of our lives we face challenges and troubles. And we feel like we go through them alone. And over the course of our lives we watch our loved ones slip out of our arms and into death. Teach us, Christ, to depend on you. To remember that you stand beside us in all the challenges of life. And that you never run away. You never leave us to face troubles on our own. Thank you too that even in death you never abandon us. Our arms fail. Our arms must let go. But you hold the ones that we love tightly in your arms forever. You pour your grace and mercy and forgiveness out on us all. Even though none of us deserve it. And in your eternal love, you carry each one of us home to be with you. In your holy name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Let's come before Christ now, come before Christ our King, and redevote our lives to following him today. Let's stand and pray together. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us following the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>